welcome to our March 9th session on the topic of recent advances in oncology, the uh, diagnostic and treatment modalities, the Ethiopian experience. Uh, it's going to be presented by um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Edo, uh, and this session is uh, is prepared in partnership with Roja Health um, and the Ethiopian Society of Internal Medicine. So welcome and thank you for joining us. And before moving on to the presentation, I will uh, say a few things about uh, what it in our guest and what the team does. Um, after that, we will move on to uh, the presentation by uh, Dr. Edo. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be your host. My name is Dr. Miro, and my co-host will be Dr. Abinezer. So stay with us and thank you very much for joining us again. Uh, so Yed uh, Enaug is a volunteer network digital health uh, platform that's registered as a nonprofit in Pennsylvania, USA. And uh, um, it's entirely operated by vol uh, by volunteers. And currently we have 70 active uh, volunteers uh, from five different countries and we're counting more. So Yed Enaug is engaged in several projects and these projects are uh, mainly divided into four areas, the health promotion, uh, community engagement, mentorship and skill sharing, and medical education, which is also the team that's responsible for organizing uh, this uh, continuous medical education session and research and QI uh, projects. So it you know, is more than a digital platform. Uh, the team is engaged in several impactful uh, initiatives, and these are pictures taken from different initiatives that uh, the team had undertaken, uh, including uh, blood drives, uh, donations, um, and also um, activities that are focused on promoting uh, inclusiveness in uh, health, uh, health care and also uh, a, health and, uh, a health and art exhibitions that we had prepared uh, in the Ethiopian New Year, uh, which explored the intersection between art and health, uh, in which we, um, and uh, part of the activities that were done were, scre were free screening for the community, um, donations given to students and uh, several art activities as well. Uh, so these are also uh, pictures uh, from the different activities that we are engaged in. And part of the project that Yet Inaug is uh, very much proud of is uh, Yet Inaug Roja has articles competitions that uh, organize in collaboration with Ethiopian Medical Students Associations. And we have had three rounds of article writing competitions. And we have had uh, several winners who have been awarded, starting from a Littman Cityoscope Pulse Oximeter to a uh, travel grant uh, for our recent uh, winners. So these are the pictures of the 2021 article writing competition. And uh, these are the 2023 uh, article writing competition winners uh, who won a travel grant to University of Glo Global Health uh, Equity in Rwanda. So the other uh, product of uh, uh, partnership with Enoch has with Roja is the research fellowships that were uh, given. So the first one was done in collaboration with Atsaba University uh, Medical Faculty, uh, where, uh, where, abs where abstract competition was undertaken. And uh, we had 10 winners uh, who... Uh, uh, who won a men uh, who who won a mentorship opportunity mentorship opportunity uh, while three were given a research uh, uh, while four were given a research uh, grant and uh, the other one uh, is the research uh, the research fellowship that was given to um, medical students uh, and this was done in collaboration with Saint Paul Million Medical uh, College and uh, we have two winners and it's now uh, launched and these are pictures of our recent fe uh, research fellowship and. Uh, winners um, from internal medicine, two from internal medicine department, one from uh, department of oncology and the other one from uh, radiology uh, department. So coming to our uh, CME, uh, they are freely accessible and they are organized in partnership with uh, several medical societies in Ethiopia, just like this one, which is uh, which is done in partnership with the Ethiopian Society of Internal Medicine. Um, and we have had uh, other sessions in partnership with uh, um, the societies that are mentioned on the slide uh, given. Uh, so we're working to provide a continuous training for all healthcare uh, professionals. And so far we have undertaken uh, more than 30 webinars. Uh, and for this year we have also planned uh, to undertake 30 uh, webinars that will be focusing on emergency surgical and medical topics, ENT, uh, pediatrics, oncology, uh, and OBGYN uh, cases. So in average, we have around 150 to 200 um, attendees. And and um, uh, most, uh, most of our speakers are uh, locally renowned, uh, well experienced, as well as uh, as well as well uh, international speakers. So in case you're wondering where you can access our previous CMEs, they have been recorded and um, 
available on Yetenaux YouTube uh, channel, uh, and the link will be uh, provided on that chat box. Um, so if you want any updates regarding the, up the upcoming CMEs uh, and also slides for the CME sessions that we have previously undertaken, then please join us on our social uh, media accounts, especially on the Telegram uh, on the Telegram channel. Uh, this channel is also going to be very important in order to keep updated on other activities that are taken by yet in uh, as well so for um so for us to have um, a smooth uh, webinar experience, um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, don't hesitate to put it on the chat box as well as on the uh, Q&A. It will later on be projected and will be discussed by our speaker today. Um, and in order to get your CE point, uh, you need to attend all uh, the webinar as a whole and you need to fill out the Google form, which will also include uh, a quiz in it and you will be required to score 50% and above in order to get your CEU point. Uh, regarding the delivery of the CEU certificate, uh, please wait patiently as it will take uh, one to two weeks in order to email it to you. And uh, uh, with this, I want to say uh, thank you and welcome to our session. And I will now be uh, introducing uh, our guest uh, speaker. So, um, so Dr. Edom. Uh, Dr. Idum completed her undergraduate studies uh, uh, in 2012 with Eben Kalanda, where after which she served as a general practitioner in Fiji Regional Hospital, and she was she has then transferred to uh, Addis Ababa University College of Health Science, where she got the opportunity to join the first the first batch of uh, clinical oncology residency training. Um, Dr. Edom uh, has gotten her experience in radiation oncology through clinical oncology training at Addis Ababa University, um, University of with Waters, uh, Waters Rand uh, and Oslo University Hospital in Norway, completing her program in 2017. And she has been working and training in the department uh, for 12 years, and she has served as a head of department for the past two years and a half. Uh, she has a great interest in female cancers, like uh, breast and oncology cancers and have spent her effort in addressing these areas, both in clinical practice, multiple research projects, and mentoring residents as well as residents as well as masters and uh, PhD students. Uh, she won American Society of Clinical Oncology um, IDA award in 2018. Uh, she is also a co-author of Harmonized National Comprehensive Can Cancer Network guideline for African Cancer Coalition on Cancer of Unknown, pri unknown uh, Primary in 2019. 19 and 2020, uh, 2020. And she has also won the MEPI uh, Fellowship Scholarship in 2019 at Saba University. And she was a fifth cohort fellow until 2021. She's known for her dedication, care, and compassion for cancer patients. Without further ado, I will welcome Dr. Uh, Edu uh, to take uh, the floor and proceed with the presentation. Good evening, everyone. I hope all audiences are from Ethiopia. So we're in the same time zone. And uh, I, I, I first would like to thank it in and uh, Roha for inviting me to be a speaker on uh, recent advances in oncology diagnostic and treatment modalities. Uh, this is my second time presenting on it and and I am always happy to uh, to share my uh, my ideas, my experience uh, to colleagues. And I always uh, would like to thank you for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so we will we'll be discussing today on some advances in diagnostic and treatment modalities in the field of oncology, uh, particularly focusing on the Ethiopian uh, context. Uh, so when we're discussing specially on the diagnostic uh, modalities, I'll be highlighting on some relevant uh, clinical um, uh, the particulars, but uh, we should all bear in mind that uh, I'm not completely an expert on the diagnostic aspects, that we utilize them um, on, a, on a routine basis for our own consumption. Uh, but when we're talking about, for example, pathology, pathologists are the experts, uh, but we work in collaboration. So um, I may not be able to you know, uh, give very detailed information as as much as a pathologist would do or as much as a radiologist would do. Uh, so like I said, I'm a clinical oncologist. I work at uh, the Grambasa Specialized Hospital at Addis Ababa University and uh, Lancet Bihari Hospital. 
uh, I have uh, no disclosures and this is going to be uh, my outline of presentation and we'll have a brief introduction then we'll directly go into the different diagnostic modalities like the laboratory pathology molecular tests and imaging and we will particularly be discussing about uh, advances in the Ethiopian setting and then we'll briefly talk about also the treatment aspects what advances there are regarding systemic therapy chemotherapy targeted therapy and uh, radiotherapy so the objectives of uh, this presentation will be the first one to discuss the notable advances in oncology diagnostics and treatment to understand the different diagnostic and therapeutic advances in the field of oncology and to be able to define some of the unique advantages of the different diagnostic and therapeutic ways and to understand at least basic pathways to, di to diagnostic and therapeutics of selected uh, cancers on the case studies we'll be seeing. So as an introduction, um, uh, in the ever-involving landscape of cancer treatment and advancements in diagnostics and therapeutics, uh, there has been a great revolution and our approach to combating uh, this complex disease has uh, actually changed a lot. And by harnessing the power of innovative diagnostic tools and tar targeted therapies, we are witnessing unprecedented opportunities to improve uh, patient outcomes and transform the way we understand and treat cancer. And this has happened because of a lot of uh, uh, research, scientific research that are being conducted. And uh, I can say that oncology is a very dynamic field or discipline, and we have witnessed remarkable progress in the recent years. And with the diagnostics, also with the therapeutics, uh, playing pivotal roles in our fight against cancer. So from cu uh, cutting edge imaging technologies that enhance detection and precision medicine approaches to tailored treatments to individual therapies and to groundbreaking immunotherapies that harness the body's immune system, we have seen remarkable improvements in the care of uh, cancer patients. So when we talk about this, I would like to acknowledge the change agents. I think uh, it is very appropriate to acknowledge uh, the discoverers, the scientists, the researchers, uh, worldwide, the different universities, uh, different research centers like ARI and others should be acknowledged. The drivers of this change, like investors and private sectors, should be also uh, acknowledged. And the users or utilizers of this technology, especially clinicians and clients, uh, clinical trial participants, all this, I think, should be acknowledged uh, because without this, stakeholders, uh, we would not be where we are now. So what is the importance of uh, uh, diagnostics when we come up and talk about diagnostics? What's the, the, the importance? It's one in early detection, also, of course, in diagnosis making, in treatment decision, in monitoring treatment response, in prognostic evaluation, and of course, in research and clinical trials. So all the investigation modalities we will talk about and more are uh, paramount important in these aspects of uh, oncology care. So we'll first dive into uh, a, a bit about, or we'll say a bit about laboratory uh, diagnostics. Uh, we'll specifically talk about tumor markers. Tumor markers, I'm sure, are not new to most of us. Tumor markers are surrogate indicators that can be used clinically. And a tumor marker is a substance or a, uh, which is present in or uh, produced by a tumor could be benign or malignant or by, by the tumors host in response to the tumor's presence. Uh, so what we have to underline uh, in this slide is it's a surrogate indicator. It's not an absolute indicator. So there are different various tumor, tumor markers for the different sites of uh, the body, uh, uh, for lung cancer, for liver cancer, for GI, for breasts, for pancreatic, for ovaries. We have various tumor markers, which are indicators. It could be in the setting of a pretreatment uh, scenario. It could be during treatment or after treatment follow-up. We routinely use these tumor markers. Of course, there hasn't been a lot of development or advancement in this field. I just wanted to remind all of us that such uh, diagnostic modalities are very important in our day-to-day -day clinical practice when we see uh, oncology patients, but what we have to really stress or uh, underscore when we talk about uh, tumor markers is they have their own limitations. So they, 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 we don't have such a, an ideal tumor marker or we don't have a tumor marker which can definitely diagnose 
either uh, presence of tumor or progression of a tumor in the uh, follow-up setting. So we don't have a tumor marker, which is highly sensitive specific, which is 100% accurate. We don't have this kind of perfect tumor marker. Tumor markers have their own uh, characteristics, but they are still uh, valuable in clinical uh, scenarios, especially in monitoring treatment response and detecting uh, cancer recurrence or indicating cancer recurrence. So we should always interpret tumor markers in combination with other clinical and diagnostic information to ensure accurate diagnosis and treatment decisions. So we shouldn't solely rely on uh, tumor markers. I'm stressing this point because I routinely see patients, for example, with a prostate cancer um, having a CA125 uh, tumor marker being done for him. And we should note that these markers are very expensive when we you know, when we request them and patients actually for unnecessary reasons have, you know, unrelated or irrelevant tumor markers, one. And the other is it creates some sort of panic, which we are going to see in the next two slides. So they have certain characteristics. Tumor markers have certain characteristics. That is one lack of specificity. So they can be elevated in non-cancerous conditions. So they could lead to false positive results. And like I said, we should correlate this with clinical uh, other clinical parameters. Uh, they have also lack of sensitivity. They are, may not be elevated in early stages of cancer in certain types, so they could lead also to negative, false negative results. And also there is interpatient, interpatient variability. So they can vary significantly among individuals with the same, even with the same uh, disease and stage of cancer. They have limited applicability, based, but still they are very useful and they are Actually, they have lack of uh, diagnostic specificity. So they should be used in conjunction with other diagnostic modalities, such as imaging, histopathology, to establish a definitive diagnosis. So having said this about tumor markers, we, we will come to advances in anatomic pathology diagnostics in Ethiopia. That, that's going to be the next diagnostic uh, uh, aspect that we use or modality that we use in oncology frequently. We mostly say that without a tissue diagnosis, without a cytologic diagnosis, we cannot really say that a certain patient has uh, cancer, except in, in rare uh, or in uh, limited uh, cases where we can't really access the tumor, like deep in the brain or deep in the body cavity, where we can't really have uh, tissue to diagnose. We need to have pathologic diagnostics to settle or to say that a certain patient has uh, cancer. So uh, when we talk about pathology these days, there is actually a, really an, an advancement or a change in the, in, the, in the field or in the discipline. We may have noticed that pathologists ask you about clinical history. They uh, request patients to bring their imaging uh, results. They may request the sending or referring physician detailed um, you know, condition about the patient. And I, I I think from the previous experience, probably some uh, some three or four years ago, we didn't used to have such, you know, uh, collaboration discussion with pathologists. We send some specimen, the patient comes with the result. But now integrated diagnosis has become a science. So the oncologist, the radiologist, the surgeon, the pathologist need to work together the pathologist needs to have enough sufficient information to make a correct diagnosis. Uh, so that thinking where pathology is only has to do with the tissue and the microscope uh, somehow has changed and they uh, really need this integrated approach. So what advancements are there as well? Uh, so the, the, the way uh, specimens are, 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 are being taken these days has also changed. So there are different uh, uh, modalities like image guided, CT guided, ultrasound guided uh, tissue biopsies that can be taken in, in recent uh, advancements in the aspect of you know, the pathology. So those, those days where we say this is deep, this is not palpable, this is not clinically accessible uh, lesion has, has now become, you know, uh, past history, we can access deep tumors, small tumors with guidance, with image guidance, and there are uh, trained uh, 
experts in this in this area. So I I would like to say that there is quite a, a, a great leap in this aspect of the uh, diagnosis. So uh, there are also endoscopic biopsies which can be taken, bronchoscopic, endoscopic, colonoscopic, or these biopsies can be taken. So uh, what what does the procedure looks like? We can have image guided core needle biopsy like tissue samples. By the way, we prefer mostly if it's possible to take a biopsy than a fine needle aspiration. I would say I would explain why we prefer that. And whenever we have the opportunity, we should take a good biopsy rather than having repeated fine needle aspirations or a penne followed by a biopsy. So whenever we can, whenever we have the chance, I, I encourage everyone to push for biopsy. So there could be image guided aspiration in some scenarios where we can't really get tissue or we can't do biopsy. Uh, and then uh, depending on the, on the results, depending on the specimen we got, we can continue to the subsequent uh, um, diagnostic modalities. So there are advancements in the, in the uh, pathology uh, service or in the pathology uh, aspect of uh, oncologic diagnosis. One of the great advancements, I would say, is the presence of immunohistochemistry. A panel of immunohistochemistry, custom or you know, uh, special or specially ordered uh, immunohistochemistry can can be done in, in nowadays uh, in, or in the recent settings of uh, oncology practice. So I would like to appreciate, like I said in the beginning of this presentation, the change uh, agents should be really acknowledged. Uh, aside from uh, government institutions like uh, the Grand Bessa Specialized Hospital, which we used to have immunohistochemistry tests some, some more than a decade ago, we haven't really had the privilege of getting immunohistochemistry tests um, in the country. They they had to be referred abroad and they take probably near to a month and they're very, very expensive. But now, uh, at least the beginning, the pioneer to immunohistochemistry was on Copato Diagnostic Laboratory. We have the opportunity to get immunohistochemistry tests for whichever uh, tissues and uncertainties we have. We have the chance to discuss with the pathologist. And nowadays we have additional diagnostic laboratories like uh, also Swiss where we can send for uh, immunohistochemistry testing. But uh, this, this, this change agents, I think, should be acknowledged. Uh, so regarding pathology, immunohistochemistry tests uh, are usually ordered for uh, mostly for undifferentiated cancers, epithelial cancers where the origin is uh, really not known. For example, a general morphologic diagnosis of adenocarcinoma uh, may not be specific enough to tailor our treatment in certain situations where we don't really, where we are not really sure whether the primary is GI or lung or uh, other other sites where adenocarcinomas can arise from. So in such situations, we order for immunohistochemistry. In undifferentiated carcinomas, we also order for immunohistochemistry to target certain uh, types of uh, uh, tumors with different characteristics, like, for example, in breast cancer, Hormone receptor status is determined using immunohistochemistry. HER2 status also done using immunohistochemistry. Um, so like we said earlier, a biopsy specimen is preferred than a cytology because it's only on a biopsy specimen that we can do further investigations of immunohistochemistry. Of course, if the cytology is done at the, at the laboratory setting itself, uh, immunohistochemistry can be done, but FNA has its own inherent limitation. It is uh, the tumor tumor is usually heterogeneous, and uh, the sp sample taken may not have the representative uh, cells which express those receptors or those markers. So we may um, miss actual findings that exist. So a biopsy is always always preferred if it is uh, possible and achievable. So moving on to the next modality of uh, diagnostics, it's molecular diagnostics. That is actually uh, very vital, very important in current day of oncology practice. 
So those days where we used to treat uh, all patients with chemotherapy, which is a kind of very generic, very uh, broad spectrum of treatment for cancer, the current day oncology practice has moved into an individual precision medicine. So molecular diagnostics is paramount important to tailor that you know specific individualized treatment. So we have different types of uh, uh, molecular diagnostics. We can detect specific mutations. We can study large chromosomal and structural variants. We can have genotyping to find mutations that have not been previously identified. And these types of uh, studies can be done both manually and in an automated uh, way. Uh, usually in our setting, because of the different limitations, we, we have uh, a laboratory which does molecular diagnosis uh, on a manual basis because we don't have kind of a lot of specimens that are analyzed. But in other settings, because they have large specimens, they do automated uh, analysis. So one of the ways, like I've mentioned, is mutation analysis. So using PCR, uh, they can identify selected mutations that involve uh, using a PCR uh, technique. And there are different other ways that mutation can be analyzed. It could be chromosomal analysis. These are uh, used to identify large structural variations, which may involve chromosomal karyotype analysis by chromosomal banding or fish. Uh, for example, fish can be done or uh, flu fluorescence in situ hybridization. And uh, we can also have next generation sequencing. So from among this, we have uh, the mutation analysis uh, in our country that can be done in our setting. Uh, next generation sequencing or uh, identifying mutations screening in, uh, you know, in the uh, large spectrum of the genes has not yet been uh, done in our country, but it can be done in a referral form. But uh, some of the diagnostic clinics or uh, laboratories are now moving towards next generation sequencing, even in our setting. The application, uh, these are not done for uh, academic purpose or for prognostic uh, prognostication. They have therapeutic implications in various tumors, actually. Of course, and now in current day oncology, uh, uh, molecular diagnostics is done almost in every cancer type, but highly applicable, of course, in melanoma, skin cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, colon, prostate, and many more types of uh, cancers have, uh, can be, you know, can benefit from uh, such uh, molecular testings. And change agents, again, I would like to thank uh, MRC ET Advanced Laboratory, Dr. Zodu, who is a molecular geneticist, who has actually been doing this um, for our patients. Like he is the only person who's doing this uh, diagnostics in our country. But of course, like I've stated, uh, in research settings, we have different uh, settings in the universities and RE, but in a commercial or in a laboratory where we can really send our patients. These are uh, the settings currently that we have. So this is all about, you know, specimens in general and um, pathology, molecular. These are the things that we can do from the tumor, sometimes from also from the peripheral, uh, from serology. The other spectrum of diagnostics is, of course, imaging. And I will pick maybe only two types of imaging, uh, which I would like to show or will, uh, I would like to share regarding, you know, advancements in oncology. One of it is MR spectroscopy. So we'll be talking about anatomic imaging. So of course we have the CT, uh, the normal MR with um, contrast that we all know, but I would like to speak a little bit about MR spectroscopy. Uh, I would like to note that, like I've said, I'm not like a complete expert in this area, but it's I, I would like to note what advancements we have in the country that we can use. So spectroscopy is a series of tests that are added to MRI scan. It's like we have a normal MRI, but we would like to, we, we are adding certain uh, peculiarities to, the, to that MRI, which can measure chemical metabolism. What's going on within the tumor can also be detected using the MR. So it analyzes the molecules such as hydrogen ions, protons, lactase, and other 
molecules or, or chemical activity that's going on within the tumor. So the distribution of electrons within an atom causes the nuclei in different molecules to experience a slightly different uh, magnetic field. That's how we'll be able to detect the different types of uh, imaging findings uh, with, like with the spec MR uh, spectroscopy. So this is a slightly different. Uh, so this activity within the the, uh, the cell causes a slightly different resonant frequencies, which in turn return to a slightly different signal and uh, you know alerts us to see or detect that finding. So when the imaging appearance is equivocal and non-neoplastic etiologies are under consideration, we may be you know um, urged to do MR spectroscopy. It's not like a routine test that we do, but there are certain situations we'll be pushed to do MR spectroscopy. And the technique may improve the differentiation of infiltrative uh, primary brain tumors from other non-neoplastic lesions like demyelination, abscess, or stroke versus uh, malignancy. And uh, this can be done by analyzing, like I said, the chemical composition in an area of interest selected by the radiologist, which the radiologist puts voxels in the appropriately uh, in the appropriate um, location, then they will be able to detect the chemical activity that's going on and say that this is not a tumor, this is demyelination, or this is stroke and others. The other imaging aspect that I would like to move on to is a functional imaging. So we've seen anatomical imaging that's based on structure, of course, with some, you know, some uh, uh, chemical touch to it. It's not like a pure anatomic imaging. There is some functional element. But a pure functional imaging, I would say, is spectroscopy uh, or SPECT. So SPECT City uh, has also been an advancement in our country in the past few months. So this is purely a nuclear medicine uh, uh, area. It's, uh, it's a discipline used for diagnosis and treatment of disease using radioactive substances. So it's a kind of... Uh, a unique way of uh, diagnostic uh, modality. So we have different instruments or different modalities like uh, PET, positron emission tomography, or SPECT. What we have in our country is SPECT. We don't yet have uh, PET. So uh, for people who may be interested, there could be uh, there is a difference between SPECT and PET. SPECT is not exactly the same as uh, PET scan uh, with a limited resolution. Uh, but with its own uh, advantages. So the SPECT single photon emission computed tomography scan is a nuclear imaging scan. It integrates computed tomography CT and a radioactive tracer. So we get a functional image plus and also a CT image. So it's a combined imaging. And the tracer is what allows the, the doctors, nuclear medicine specialists to see how the blood flows to tissues and organs. And this is what makes it functional. So the function of the body, the different body parts, whether it's the liver, the bladder, the kidneys, or a tumor cell, differs from other cells, like a normal bone tissue versus bone, which has tumor, have different blood, blood flows. And these radioactive tracers will show us where, where there is higher blood flow versus lower blood flow. And the tracers, uh, the activity of the tracers will be um, detected because they emit the gamma rays, and they are detected by the CT scanner. Uh, so there are different uh, applications uh, and the benefits, which is, like I said, purely, or uh, the what you makes, makes it unique is its functionality, functional imaging. So it gives us the per information about the perfusion, the metabolism, the viability even. Is it a live tumor tissue or a necrotic tissue? specific function of the tumor or any any other sort of uh, lesion that, that the patient may have can be detected by this sort of uh, imaging. That can actually not be done by the normal conventional imaging that we have. And also, of course, it has a therapeutic uh, aspect to it, like radionuclide therapy can also be achieved using this uh, uh, modality. Uh, so the application could be diagnosis and treatment of all differentiated thyroid cancers, as well as diagnostic workup, uh, breast cancer, uh, scintigraphy, scintimammography. We can have workup of bone metastasis and metastatic bone pain palliation, 
neuroendocrine uh, tumors imaging imaging in therapy of neuroblastoma pheochrocytoma paraganglioma can also be achieved using this modes of uh, imaging and for thyroid cancers uh, both uh, diagnostic also, as well as therapeutic, especially therapeutic aspect is very essential by using iodine-131 and it can be used as an adjuvant treatment post-surgery and also in the setting of metastatic thyroid cancer, especially the well-differentiated uh, cancers like follicular and papillary, we can use um, radio-iodine therapy. Bone scintigraphy or bone scan also can be used, especially for tumor for patients who have who have suspicious metastasis. Uh, basically, we want to use these types of modalities for patients whom we may, we may suspect they have occult metastasis, which who present with uh, you know mild pain, elevated alkaline phosphatase, or multiple sites of metastasis. We may find one metastasis on CT imaging, but we suspect that this patient may have multiple sites. Then we may be um, you know. Um, it may be good to use these types of investigations. So in lymphomas, we can also use, so depending on the tumor type, we use different um, uh, tracers that that are that have higher affinity to that type of uh, tumor. So there there has been there have been different uh, treatments, diagnostics that have been done in our uh, setting and in, in Ethiopia. So of, again, I would like to, uh, acknowledge uh, the change agents. Pioneer Diagnostics is the first and the currently the only uh, place where we can find uh, SPECT uh, imaging, but Addis Ababa University and Juma University are also on the way. Uh, so we will soon have at least three centers which we can send for these types of investigations as well as therapy. Uh, there are limitations with this uh, um, nuclear imaging the, the 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 i think i would say the the biggest challenge is unavailability of the tracers in country so we don't have uh, you know the cyclotons or, or others which we can produce uh, tracers so tracers are being imported from other countries usually from nearby countries uh, so their continuous uh, availability of these services is um, uh, is not there so patients usually are appointed and as soon as the, the tracers arrive, the patients are called in bulk and all the investigations treatments are done in group. Uh, the other challenge would be that most of the tracers have a very short lifetime. So uh, as soon as the tracers arrive in the country, they have to be quickly cleared from customs and also patients have to arrive um, you know, very quickly so that they can undergo the treatment or the investigations. Mm, so, I would I, I will end diagnostic approaches uh, here and come briefly talk about to about uh, treatment of cancer. Um, so I would briefly talk about systemic treatment, uh, which unfortunately, uh, as as a country, we are lagging behind. Even though the diagnostic approaches are advancing, available systemic treatment is very much you know. Uh, uh, limited. So uh, when we talk about targeted therapy, which I mentioned earlier, uh, individualized treatment, it's a type of cancer treatment that targets proteins, uh, which control how cancer cells grow, divide and spread. And it's the foundation of uh, precision medicine. So there are different types of uh, targeted therapies. Broadly, we can divide them as small molecule and uh, uh, mononuclear uh, antibodies, Small molecules, these are small uh, enough to enter the cells easily. They enter into the tumor cells and they are used for targeting uh, you know, the tumor uh, or the tumor cells, the nuclear mutations and others that exist within the cell. So the, uh, the most commonly mentioned uh, small molecule drugs are uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as imatinib, which is which most of us know is used to treat uh, CML, oh, chronic myeloid leukemia. Monoclonal antibodies, they are bigger molecules. They are uh, also known as therapeutic antibodies. They are proteins produced in the lab. 
And these are designed to attach to specific targets found on cancer cells. So the previous small molecules, we said they enter into the cell, but these monoclonal antibodies, they act on the on outside the, the, the cell. And uh, some monoclonal antibodies uh, mark cells so that they will be better seen and destroyed by the immune system. The others uh, directly stop cancer cells from going or cause them to self-destruct. Uh, commonly known examples for monoclonal antibodies is rituxima, which is used for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma treatment, which has actually revolutionized the treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Trastuzumab, also used in breast cancer, also uh, has changed the paradigm of uh, HER2 positive breast cancer treatment uh, in the past more than 10 years. So when we talk about monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies, it indicates that the tumor cells need to have certain, you know, receptors that are uh, uh, that have to be positive in order to prescribe these drugs. So this is uh, sh showing how monoclonal antibodies uh, work. So you can see uh, the green ones are the monoclonal antibodies, and they attach to certain specific receptors on the cells in order to, you know, stop the down uh, the, the cascade, which will lead to mutation and proliferation of the cell. Uh, so these uh, targeted therapies, they can either work by uh, stopping signals that help from uh, the formation of blood vessels, which of course lead to progression or growth of the tumor cells, such as bevacizumab. These are anti angiogenetic agents, which are mostly used in colon cancer. Uh, they may deliver cell killing substances to cancer cells, such as toxins. They can carry chemotherapy with them and deliver those, those agents when they reach the uh, cancer cells. Or they may starve cancer cells of hormones that they need to grow, such as like the, the very uh, old treatments that we know used for breast cancer, for prostate cancer, are also in the category of targeted therapy. They may also uh, use the mechanism uh, of helping the immune system to destroy the cancer uh, cells. They are called immunotherapy. So these are the different uh, modalities uh, of uh, you know, systemic targeted therapies. Unfortunately, we have almost very few to none uh, targeted therapies available in the country. Uh, but nowadays, you know, patients uh, go abroad for treatment. They bring some of the treatments with them. We find some of the the drugs available in the you know private pharmacies uh, through different uh, ways. Uh, but this, I would say, is one of the, the ways we've been uh, challenged the most. We're still using the traditional. Uh, chemotherapy as uh, treatment for patients. Even if these targeted therapies are available, they are extremely very expensive for patients to afford. And um, these treatments usually are not offered for patients in a way that we know traditionally we give chemotherapy like with cycles, four cycles, six cycles, but these are usually offered until patient progression or uh, and intolerable side effects or certain durations which are very long, usually more than six months, nine months a year. And this becomes actually very expensive uh, for most of our patients since uh, this is where we actually face the most challenge. Uh, the other uh, aspect of treatment for cancer that I would uh, like to mention is radiotherapy. So I would like to say uh, that uh, radiotherapy treatment has actually, we've, we've made remarkable improvement in that line. So I, I work in Black Lion, like I've said, and Juma uh, uh, and Harrell also have acquired linear accelerators next to Addis Ababa University to Grambesa Specialized Hospital. So we've been using our linear accelerator uh, the past three years, and we've actually uh, managed to deliver advanced radiotherapy uh, to our patients. These advanced radiotherapy techniques actually offer patients the best treatment. If you can uh, look at the, the bottom three images, cross-sectional images, uh, this is a site where the oncologist is wishing to treat a kind of uh, 
sinonasal area. So this is the old way 3D conformal radiotherapy. This is a volumetric arc modulated therapy. This is a proton therapy. So what differences do we see? If you see this blue line, this blue uh, shade around uh, towards the periphery of this, this big circle. So this is this is uh, called dose pillage. So we have a lot of you know high dose going to the uh, normal tissues. This is probably the area that we would like to treat, but look where the dose is going. This all normal tissue is being irradiated because of the very nature of the modality of treatment that we are using 3D conformer. The more we modulate, the more we try to conform to the uh, tumor, you know, the more we save the normal tissue. This, this uh, uh, white blue line you see is a very low dose area, but this blue is a high dose area. So you see this, this uh, dark blue line has somehow conformed to the tumor when we compare to this one. So this is because of this modulation that we have uh, applied. Proton therapy, of course, this is a particle therapy. This is more, more precise than all photon therapies. Uh, we don't actually have it in, in our country and even in Africa. Uh, I know South Africa has proton therapy, probably Tunisia or one of the uh, Northern Africa uh, countries have one. So uh, even in, in the whole world, we have very few uh, limited centers who have protons. These are applied for very limited uh, scenarios and they are very expensive, of course. But VMAT, we've been able to, to employ in our center. So for head and neck tumors, especially where we have a very tight space with very intricate, very uh, delicate um, tissues sensitive to radiation located very near to each other, application of VMAT or IMRT has uh, achieved a remarkable improvement in patient outcome as well as uh, toxicity. So this is the way VMAT is offered. It's a kind of, like I've said, it's volumetric. So it employs, you know, continuous radiation, small fields. So that's why it becomes a circle. But when we see 3D, you may have one field coming here, one big field coming here, another big one here. So that's why we uh, we have a larger area uh, related to hydro. So this, I would say, is one of the biggest advancements in radiotherapy uh, in Ethiopia. So having said this, I'll go to the case discussions. We have, I think, three or uh, yeah, three uh, cases where we can summarize what we have seen so far. The first case is a 60 years old male was diagnosed with prostate cancer. On CT, he has metastatic lesion on the pubic rami. So to further uh, evaluate the extent of the metastasis, bone scan was done. On bone scan, uh, the confirmation was that the, the only lesion, metastatic lesion that exists in this uh, patient is also uh, on the pubic rami. So there was no other site of uh, bone metastasis. So with this investigation result, we decided to give him radical radiotherapy to the prostate because there are evidences with oligometastatic prostate cancer, you can really treat the prostate with a radical intent. So you can see how this imaging actually changed the, the, the way we think and treat uh, these patients. Another case is a 65 year old male with metastatic lung cancer. He has completed six cycles of uh, platinum based chemotherapy. Uh, mind you, this is a metastatic lung cancer. So after a while he experienced a partial response, but now, just after some time passed, he progressed with new metastatic lesions. So the patient's oncologist faced, uh, he was faced with a therapeutic dilemma regarding the next treatment option. Traditional chemotherapy regimens have limited efficacy in this setting, and oncologist considers targeted therapy. So what to do? Molecular tests become very important in this setting. So next generation sequencing, before that even, we can do simple mutation tests like EGFR and ALK. And if patients uh, become EG, if have EGFR positive uh, lung cancer, there are targeted therapies, anti-EGFR uh, treatments. If ALK positive, anti-ALK uh, uh, treatments, ALK, ALK inhibitors. So uh, this actually changes the whole picture or the whole uh, trajectory of 
uh, patients' treatment outcomes, survival and uh, symptoms, quality of life and everything. Mostly these are oral agents. They can be taken at home. Uh, patients actually uh, face mild to moderate tolerable side effects, but with significant uh, difference in outcome. The third case is 50-year-old male who is diagnosed with advanced nasopharyngeal cancer. The tumor is large and it involves the base of the skull. The patient is otherwise healthy with no significant comorbidities. So we can see uh, the tumor is uh, involving the base of the skull. So what, wh whenever we have such patients, the, the problem we face is we need to treat the, the tumor, but there are organs that are sensitive to certain dose of radiation very near to the tumor, like the chiasm, the optic nerve, the cochlea, the lens, the eyes, the brain stem. So all this becomes, you know, an issue. So uh, short of advanced uh, uh, therapeutic modalities like VMAT, it will be very difficult to achieve therapeutic dose to the tumor while restricting those to the organs at risk. So these are uh, kind of the applications where we can really employ the advancements in diagnostics and in therapeutics in cancer. Uh, with this, I would like to end uh, my my talk and I appreciate your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ido. Thank you very much for the really nice uh, presentation with such uh, in, with such an information. So uh, we have no uh, questions that are um, forwarded to you so far. So in the meantime, until our attendees can come up with uh, questions, we will be, sh uh, we'll be sharing the quiz link on the chat box uh, and we'll give them time um, to do the question. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Miron. So. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ito, once again. Once again, for sharing your experience and for the, this insightful and wonderful presentation. Currently, uh, since oncology is one of the most important uh, and pre uh, prevalent diseases in our country, since different diagnostic and treatment modalities practiced in our country. So I would like to thank you again for your nice uh, presentation. So we will proceed to the question and answer. So is my uh, audio... Okay, Dr. Meru. Yes, you wrote a So the first question will be, which one of the following morphologic diagnosis is an indication for recommending immunohistochemistry uh, test? A, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. B, undifferentiated carcinoma. C, anaplastic thyroid cancer. D, and B. So Dr. Edom, we will uh, discuss on that. Okay, thank you. So, uh, like we have stated uh, at the beginning, uh, morphologic diagnosis may be enough in some situations. You don't need to order immunohistochemistry for each and every morphologic diagnosis, but certain morphologic diagnosis may uh, require additional immunohistochemistry testing. Mm -hmm. One of which is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, in this setting, we need to know whether the lymphoma cells have markers which are sensitive to additional targeted therapy like rituximab. So that can be done using immunohistochemistry. Undifferentiated carcinoma, we have mentioned earlier, undifferentiated carcinoma uh, basically for treatment has no use for this. Almost uh, very difficult to treat patients with this morphologic diagnosis. So in this scenario, mm -hmm. we will request for additional immunostochemistry testing to tell us whether this carcinoma, what type of characteristics it has. Is it originating from, does it seem to originate from GI, from uh, other telial cells, like in a female gynecologic uh, primary in, in males? Is it prostate? Is it... So all these things uh, would be answered if we have an immunohistochemistry testing. By the way, we should know that immunohistochemistry is not the answer for everything, but it really has changed the way we treat patients. So in current uh, situations where we have similar dilemmas, we send for immunohistochemistry tests. And in most scenarios, we've seen that 
and we found uh, good answers with immuno. So the two situations are actually the morphologic diagnosis that require immuno and a plastic, of course, it doesn't require any immuno, it's clear. So the second question is, uh, which imaging modality is the best to detect in the stage uh, solid tumors? Uh, so MRI, EEG, ECG, and PET, of course, the two choices automatically out. MRI versus PET. We could also add CT, we could add SPECT to this uh, pool. So uh, staging of solid tumors, you know, solid tumors can occur anywhere from brain to skin to breast, lung, anywhere in our body. So uh, we haven't really specified this question. It's just to 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 know or to, to see how we think. So in solid tumors, uh, for example, MRI cannot be applicable in every site. For example, MRI is best in pelvic tumors. When you have a rectal CA, cervical cancer, best imaging modality would be MRI, but it's not the best for everything. But when we come to PET scan, it is um, uh, it has become the most important staging uh, imaging diagnostics nowadays. Almost in every uh, tumor types, uh, where it is available. So we, we don't actually have it available in our setting. What replaces PET in our setting is mostly CT. And we do CT chest, CT abdomen in situations or in scenarios where we need or require to uh, appropriately stage patients. So PET scan, which is a functional uh, test, a functional diagnostic or functional imaging, with CT, of course, PET CT would be the best um, modality to stage uh, solid tumors, uh, almost wherever they occur. MRI is the best in certain situations, but still, it will be helpful in local staging, but metastatic staging still will require additional uh, imaging. So PET CT would be an ideal uh, diagnostic tool. Okay, okay thank question. you, Doc. The next question will be, which of the following is an advantage of nuclear medicine technique in cancer diagnosis? A, high spatial resolution, B, functional imaging, C, real-time visual of blood flow, and D, direct visualization of tissue abnormality. You can proceed, Doc. Yeah, yeah. so uh, when we talk about uh, nuclear med te medicine techniques, we have said that it's a functional imaging. What we mean by function is, even if we have some lesion, for example, um, lesion in the in the lungs, uh, post treatment, if we uh, if we have mostly if we have a PET scan, uh, short of PET specs, we can see whether that remnant lesion is uh, an active tumor or a dead tissue necrotic. Uh, the most uh, disease type where we apply. Uh, nuclear medicine in, in cancer diagnosis, in cancer um, monitoring, for example, is lymphomas, uh, head and neck tumors, esophageal tumors, which actually have a lot of lymph nodes that, that are involved, some reactive, some uh, tumor. So in such scenarios, uh, diagnostic uh, advantage of nuclear medicine is because it's functional. In thyroid tumors, also it's about functionality. Does it uptake iodine or not? So the, the peculiar advantage of nuclear medicine technique is it is a functional imaging. Uh, spatial resolution uh, may have may come with the you know with the uh, uh, type of imaging that we use, whether it is say, SPECT or C PET CT. Spatial resolution may vary, but peculiarity with regards to nuclear medicine diagnostics, is it's, it is a functional image. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The last question will be, which laboratory tumor marker is commonly used for the diagnosis and monitoring of colonic CA, A, prostate uh, paste CA, or in prostate specific antigen, B, being carcinoembryonic antigen, C, alpha fetoprotein, and D, human chorionic gonadotropin? Yeah, I think this is a kind of a bonus question. So. Uh, PSA automatically is out. It's in, in prostate uh, cancer. But uh, I have seen one question. Also, can we use PSA in screening? Uh, of yes. course, in screening, in treatment, PSA cannot be uh, fully diagnostic. We've, we've talked about 
the limitations of uh, tumor markers. They are surrogate. They are they should be used in addition to other diagnostic modalities. But CEA is a, a unique marker for colon cancer. Monitoring and diagnosis in addition to other diagnostic modalities alone. We cannot diagnose colon cancer. We cannot diagnose recurrence of colon cancer or progression of colon cancer with CEA, but that's the best marker for colon cancer. AFP for hepatocellular, HCG for some germ cell tumors like uh, choriocarcinoma, seminomas, we can use HCG. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Doc. Uh, you have also uh, addressed the one question that came on the chat box. Uh, so this will be... Uh, the end of our presentation. Thank you, thank you Dr. Edom. In, on behalf of Tate and Oxy, we are very much grateful uh, for the for the nice uh, presentation and concise one. Uh, so good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Miran and everyone.